Hello again, everybody. Uh, picking up from last time, uh, we're still in the area of world building. This is the larger, you know, building the larger world. Uh, now, when you're building the larger world, which is, you're probably wondering why I have a picture of somebody's cellar in here. Uh, one of the things about world building is you're not necessarily going to start out with continent or world or galaxy sized descriptions and world building and stuff. Parts of world building that are that are of big impact can sometimes be the smallest of things that uh, that affect larger sweeping parts of the book. Uh, take uh, take this for example. This would be uh, depending on where you live, because uh, when I grew up, this was a big thing, and this wasn't like doomsday prepping. Don't totally don't get that idea. What this is, is this is a standard winter cellar. Uh, like I say, when I was growing up as a kid, this is what we did. Because we, everything we ate, we either harvested, butchered, or grew ourselves. We had our own cattle. We had our own garden. We went out hunting. Yes, I know people who don't like hunting. They're probably going to freak out about that. But back when I was growing up, you either did that or you didn't eat. And that was that was life. That was the pioneers. That was people in antiquity. You know, you either stored up for winter, raised your own garden, raised your own cattle, butchered your own meat, hunted your own, you know, hunted wildlife, trapped wildlife, stuff like that. That you either did that or you died, and you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for your ancestors doing that. So, you know, like I say, I'm not going to go down that whole uh, deep dark rabbit hole. But anyways, that's. That's why this exists. Is this, is, this is how people existed before supermarkets. Uh, but anyways. Looking at this here, you know, you've got... You've got potatoes, you've got tomatoes, green beans, corn, applesauce, regular fresh tomatoes. Those, those would probably st stay with you for a good half of the winter, which is where this is useful because this half... This takes over when these stop being a thing. And these will probably, depending on how you store them, about half the winter. And then they're going to start rotting away and not be useful anymore. Uh, and if you have canning jars, you can probably can those up at that point in time. But you have fresh tomatoes up through probably half the winter. Uh, but anyways, let's just say in world building, and sorry for all the background, but I figured you guys needed that. Uh, but... You know, when you're talking about world building, little things like this are hugely important. Because, say you have a character who lives in the mountains. They have four months of summer and six months of winter, which pretty much is Michigan. But, uh, you know, you got four four months of the year to grow stuff, maybe three. Uh, in some areas, like, uh, uh, Ter was it Terrafall or was it, uh, I'm trying to think who it was. It was... Uh, was it Terrafall? Yeah, okay, it was Terrafall up in the Windrock Mountains. Uh, they, you know, that comes from the Awful Chronicles. You know, they've got three months they can grow stuff in. They barely get their crops in because, they, you know, they their winter is like eight months. Uh, and when winter shows up, it shows up fast. Uh, spring shows up fast too, and summer too, but you only have actually like three months to grow stuff. Beyond that, you know, beyond that, you've got eight months of winter that you've got to survive in. Uh, which is where stuff like this would be important. Like in the old days, you might have, you know, you might have this in a different form. Like they would not have had canning jars, you know, and pressure canners like what we have. They would have had... Uh, dried food they would have had fermented foods they would have had a lot of fermented foods because fermented foods uh vinegar um you might have uh well grape wine grape wine came around came about because people were trying to preserve grape juice and then natural yeast got in there and pff, suddenly you've got grape wine uh and fermented foods is a great way to store food long long term uh, again this pulls from my childhood because we used to do sauerkraut which if you've ever tried to preserve cabbage over the winter uh, yeah that 
you get about a month out of it on the shelf and then it, you got to throw it out because it just gets nasty. Fermenting it and turning it into sauerkraut allows you to hold it for a year or better. Now you can pressure can it and store it for longer than that, but if it's in its natural state and it's just in a crock somewhere, covered over so it doesn't mold and get dirt in it and stuff like that. But once it's fermented, you can go down there, scoop out a bunch, you know, with like middle winter, 20 below, just go down there, scoop out a big old, uh, you know, big old ladle or whatever of sauerkraut, take that upstairs and heat it up and have it for dinner. Uh, tomatoes would have been like sun-dried. They would have taken them, sliced them up, put them on wood boards, or if they had rocks or something, they would have laid them out on the rocks, they could have laid them out on strings or whatever, dried them out, and then you got dried tomatoes, and those you throw them in a pot of water, rehydrate them, and boom, you've got, you know, tomato sauce, uh, tomato slices, whatever you want like that, you have it during the winter. Uh, this right here, these cellars, were a make and break for winter, for societies. If those ran out before the before winter ran out, people were dying. People were going to starve to death. And that was a big driver of a lot of societies. Uh, if you follow the... Uh, I don't have a picture of it. I probably should have grabbed one, but you can go out and research this. If you look at history, uh, they, they've got graphics out there where uh, it shows like when you had a natural warm period, these great big empires took off and they they grew and they got powerful and stuff like that. But then it went, when the, the trajectory of nature shifted to the colder side of things, those empires fell because when it got colder, you couldn't grow as much and the empire dwindled in strength and eventually collapsed. You know, how much food you have and how your harvests work drive societies. Uh, like when I, going back to Terrafall, one of the things that I mentioned, uh, and you're going to hear more about this in the After Off World series when I eventually get that out there. Uh, but one of the things about, uh, one of the things about like Terrafall is the fact that they understand the shortcomings of their uh, their society. They understand the shortcomings of their food supply, which is why they have harvest moss. Uh, they understand that if they have a bad year, people are going to die. Not they could die; it's they will die. Uh, there's just going to be there's going to be starvation. When there's starvation, there's plagues, and then the plagues and the, you know they get. The weak people get sick first, but then they take the strong people and they get sick, uh, and things like that. So, you know, that, like I say, the food drives societies. Now, it might not drive your particular book or your particular story, but armies march on their stomach. Societies thri uh, thrive or die on their, on their stomachs. And like with Terrafall, uh, they have that great big castle up in uh, the capital of Ariton. That castle is not strictly defensive. Inside that castle, what they do is, as a tax by the king, uh, which helps him fund his military and feed them and feed himself and his, and his nobles and stuff like that, they have a tax of the crops and the fields. Well, that tax also works on years when they have bad crops. Like, say, for example, it's a colder than normal year and the crops fail. Uh, oh, crap, we don't have enough food to keep everybody going all winter. Fine, we'll just open the storehouses and we'll bring out our wheat and our oats and any of our long-term grains and anything that you can store long-term. Uh, things like tomatoes, not really. Tomatoes, yeah. The best you can do is save, you know, save what you can save for the seeds. Uh, you want to have probably two or three years, four years of of seeds in stock, just in case you do have a couple of bad harvests. Uh, potatoes, uh, those you really kind of have to do a multi-variety thing. Um, and I'm stating this not like you know you need to know this to survive. It's you need to know these things for your books. 
because uh, like you take a look at the the Mayans and the people that were like in Machu Picchu and stuff like that one of the very wise things that they did was they raised a variety of potatoes we're very, you know in America and a lot of countries around the world it's very much a, a biological monoculture you know white potatoes red potatoes uh, yams and a few other things in places you know in antiquity you might have one farmer grow 15, 20, 25 different varieties of potatoes. Not one, not two. At least 15. I think the Mayans had over 30 of them. The idea being, in, in some years, you're going to have a bumper crop of one particular breed of potato. Or two, or five, or ten. And the other breeds are just going to suck. They're just go they just will not germinate. And if you do get some potatoes, you're not going to get many. And if you don't get many, you take those, you dig them out of the ground, you set them back as seed potatoes. And next year when you plant your potatoes, those, you know, you don't eat them. You just set them back. And then in the spring when they, when they build their little, or when they grow their little eyes, you slice them up, you heal them over, stick them in the ground. Oh, hey, next year now we've got a bumper crop, but the crop the last year that was a bumper crop is not okay. You know, but potatoes, you have to plant those every year. You can't be like, oh, I've got three years of drought. Well, if you got three years of drought, you ain't going to have any potatoes unless you grow them like in a specially watered area. Uh, but yeah, you have to take those every year and plant those. Other, plant, other plants, like carrots, uh, I think carrots, you can hold those for three to five years without planting them. At least hold the seeds that long. I know there's other ones like some of the bean crops that you can hold those for... Oh good heavens! Fifty, sixty, hundred years. I've heard of, I've heard of squash and wheat, that's two thousand years old, and they put it in the ground and it germinated and it grew and it created this amazing crop. So some seeds have a very short shelf life. Uh, other seeds have a really long shelf life. It's a matter of keeping them cool and dry, keeping them stored in a good place where they're not jostled and bumped around. Uh, you don't want them to get too dry. But you also don't want them to get wet because if they wet, they start germinating. And if they start germinating, they die and they can't go all the way. They die and then you lose the seeds. So, you know, and I'm stating, all, again, I'm stating all of this because I'm trying to make you realize that you need to know this stuff. Even if you don't use it in the story, these things drive your story. Because like I say, I, don't know, I mean, I'm covering a lot more than I covered in the books with Offworld with uh, Terrafall. But it's part of what spawned harvest moss it's part of what spawned the way their society works uh it's if you want to think of it this way it's the paving stones down which the the romans marched you know to use that kind of a uh, colloquialism without those paving stones yeah rome could march down the road but they would have a lot harder time especially when it gets wet but those paving stones then make transit to and from really easy and it's the same idea with the story you want you want this information because this information will make uh, writing your story and building your world a lot easier. Uh, okay, here's another interesting one. A girl and a dragon. I'm not going to go too deep into this one, but uh, I'll let you... I'll leave this one as one of those ones that you can experiment with, because I think this one's a neat neat one to work with. Uh, some of the questions you could ask yourself is, who is she? Why is she here? What's... You know, who is this dragon? What is he? What kind of dragon? Uh, what is his purpose? Uh, why is he grinning at her the way he is? Very sly, devious grin. Uh, is he her friend? What's his personality like? Uh, you know, what are the? What is the world that they live in? Uh, what is their connection? Is she like a a ritual gift to him, basically, an afternoon snack to appease him so that he doesn't go and wreck the whole kingdom because he's hungry? Uh, you know things like that that's that's stuff to look into this one here now this is another good one for building the world behind which the characters live like that for example this guy is the character this back here is the world uh, like who are the birds what is this village what are these houses who lives there who's the old lady or middle-aged lady whatever she is uh, this creek uh, is he on like a little land bridge is it got like a culvert underneath it uh, is this a pond? Is this feed in from somewhere else? Uh, what is the value of this? Uh, does it feed the land? Is this a field? Is this just somebody's lawn with like little grass growing like you have here? Uh, 
you know, why is this fence here? Is it a safety fence? Is it a is it a uh, fence for a field? Is this part of the part of the field? Uh, what are these shrubs here for? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. You know, you got forest behind it. Looks like a pine forest. Uh, multiple chimneys, probably somewhere in the northern regions, like uh, northern Europe, uh, North America, the upper areas, like from. Uh, like the Ohio Valley North up into Canada and stuff. It could be stuff like that. It could be good old England. It could be any number of places. But, you know, these are the things you need to build into your worlds. This is another one. Uh, you know, who is she? What is she doing? Uh, what is the world she's in? Why is she standing in a field of grass, basically. Is this actually wheat? Is this uh, a grazing field? Is this just a wild field? Is she collecting flowers? Is she collecting herbs? To me, that would look like she's collecting herbs. If she's collecting herbs, why is she collecting herbs? Why is she wearing this scarf and this outfit? I mean, if she's out there working, she's off awfully well-dressed for for going out working, because uh, that dress is way too nice to be out in the field. Uh, is she a merchant that's heading to town? Is she gathering flowers because she's serenading somebody? And you know, and yes, the girl, the girls can serenade the guys. So it's not just guys serenading girls. Uh, I've seen a lot of girls actually initiate the uh, relationship rather than the guys. So it could go either way. It just depends on who's the stronger party. Um, and although it's a bit blurry here, you've got a background. You know, is this is this a farm? Is this a village? You know, those are questions you need to ask when you're doing your building. Um, this one's an interesting one from the fact that there's very, very little information. But that fact that there's very little information makes it very flexible on what you can do with this. You know, is this a destination? Is this something that the kids come up to and they jump off and splash in the water? Uh, is it the border to a country? Is it... Uh, it may not be part of your whole world. It might be a destination. Uh, taking Awful Chronicles, for example, uh, or even Land of the Lions and uh, Li Lion of the Earth, they had uh, one of the cities. Um, well, like in Awful Chronicles, you had Trail Point. Let me see if I can remember the the uh, I'll probably remember it this way up I'm on a different screen looking this up give me just a second uh, da -da -da -da. there he is There's the world able north that's what it was able north that was a destination that was one little town a uh, small farming village as a matter of fact it's important to the story but it's not part of the larger world. This is kind of like a little sublet. So what you're seeing here, this would be a sublet to a story. This might be a place that everybody knows and they go to do dueling. They go to sword duel, uh, they go to swim, uh, they go to collect their daily water, they go to fish, you know. It's important to the story, but it's a sublet. It's a small part of the larger story, like Trail Point for off -world Chronicles. Basically, Trail Point was the impetus or the jumping off point that got them to meeting, uh, well, it helped get uh, Alex, you know, helped get Alex saved. Uh, it helped demonstrate more of who Simon was. Uh, it helped mature Arya and Trevor. It, it, it actually, uh, it didn't like kickstart their relationship, but what it did was it kicked it up another level because it finally got Trevor to confess to Arya. Uh, so it was a very small part of the story, but it was, a, it was an important part because it, it changed Alex. It took Arya and Trevor's uh, relationship up, an, an up another level. You learn things about some of the characters you wouldn't have learned otherwise. Uh, they met uh, the Baroness, uh, Susan Wheaton, which brought her into the story. It brought Hollow Manor into the story. Uh, that was actually the jumping off point to uh, Simon and, 
and Susan's relationship. And you find out about that later on. Not much is done with it initially, but more of it happens later on. You'll, you'll see it uh, definitely in the first book of After Offworld. Uh, but without Trail Point, you wouldn't have had uh, the other things that happened beyond that. Some of those would have happened, but there would have been other things that didn't happen be, you know, without that one item. And it's a sparse item, but it's an important item to the world. And those are things you have to work with because not everything is going to be uh, kind of tongue in cheek here. The the Zarbamba of world building items. You know, you're not you you know it's not the greater galaxy and these great empires and stuff. It's Lou. I was waiting for that. <laughs> Yawns are back. He was. You know, it's not these great sweeping empires and kings and emperors and the big elements. It's the little ones. Because like I say, without Trail Point, the other things that happened after that would not have happened. Or if they happened, they would have happened later and probably to a lesser degree and there would have been things would have flowed differently. Uh, like in Land of the Lions, Abel North. Very small village. Uh, but it was a key moment that got the lions going in the right direction. It was a jumping off point to bigger things. Uh, this is where Tagani first meets the Horde. This is where uh, some of the things he's been learning uh, suddenly, you know, they suddenly gain a foundation. They gain a uh, they gain a purpose. They gain a uh, a motivation for him to do other things. Without that, without Abel North, he might have gone in that direction, but it would have been through an entirely different set of means and probably would have taken longer and would have had a different result. So there are little items, which you know kind of goes along with this waterfall, there's little items in your story that can have big impacts. So don't, you know, don't just ignore the little things because they're little. Uh, those little things can have huge, huge impacts on your stories. Um, like with uh, Offworld Chronicles. If Simon and the others had skipped the uh, had skipped around the bandits or not met the bandits or the bandits hadn't raided them if the ba especially the raiding part if the bandits hadn't raided them if they hadn't actually run into the bandits they never would have met uh, Barash they never would have met Yurd they never would have met Alex so you wouldn't have had them in the story because that was a very important part of the story that brought in those other guys. Without that part, even though it was little, without that part, you wouldn't have had the bigger parts of the story. You wouldn't have had them as major participants. And without them as the major participants, there's other things that either wouldn't have happened that needed to or did have or would have happened that you didn't want to because then the you know, bad things would have happened. So remember that. that that, li that sometimes the little things are big things and the big things are little things. So, oh, where are we at? Oh, only 23 minutes. Yay! Okay. Here's another one. This goes back to the food thing. Uh, this one, uh, it depends on your story. You may not need something like this. Uh, with uh, Uffo Chronicles, I, sh I did a couple of actual farming scenes. Uh, like they got down in the Clement Valley and they ran into uh, I'm trying to think of what his name was uh, the one farmer this is why I have a wiki <laughs> it's trying to remember these people uh, trying to think here Okay, it's Bartholomew Wickham. Oh, that's who it was. Emmett Brownstone, the farmer. Uh, one of the things I cover with him, you know, Simon landing there is you see a little bit more of Simon because you find, you know, you know the fact that he's kind of a farmer and computer geek, so he's kind of got this survivalist slash nerd. Uh, vibe to him. It's kind of a duality. And this is where you get to see the farmer side of him. And 
you get to experience some of the different crops because you hear them mentioned earlier but then in in that section I get to expound on them a little bit more uh, like and then if you go down further on like and they get over into uh, root wand uh, you start hearing about these crops these you know you've heard about some of the crops but then you hear about other crops and if you hadn't heard about the other crops before, like in the Clement Valley and in some of the other places along the way, then them having those crops there wouldn't have the impact on the story that they did. They wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't have the background that you did on the different bits of the world because you might, you look at it and go, okay, they talk about the various grains and they talk about, you know, the various fruits and vegetables and things like that. What's the importance? Well, you get into that inn where they stay at in Groot Wand, now all of a sudden you've got uh, you know, now you've got something that's got a lot more background to it, a lot more depth, it's got more importance to the story, etc, etc. And if you hadn't had that, you wouldn't have that uh, you wouldn't have that foundation on which the story would rest. Because, you know, it might not seem like uh, their meal of steak and potatoes, green beans, and potato. Er, yeah, steak and potatoes with green beans is going to seem that important. But if the person has the preamble to that, and they understand, okay, well, they have. Uh, uh, I'll just call them what, what what we know them as just to make it easier. But you know, they got okay. Well, here's the wheat and the and the barley and the green beans and the corn and stuff like that. You know, if they didn't have that. It would be like, okay, he had a mug of beer. whoop do doo He had a mug of beer. But if, you know, he had a... You know, he had a mug of blue elven ale. Okay, now you've got a little bit more depth to what he's having. It's not just, oh, he's drinking a, a, you know, a mug of ale. He's drinking blue elven ale, and it's out of a, a wooden mug with, you know, with metal banding, and it comes from the... Uh, from the blue elves up in the mountains, and they make it out of the, uh, you know, the, the, the blue chestnut cherry, and you know, now you're starting to see how it, or you know, are you starting to see how that goes from a mug of ale to something that's got way more depth? Now it's like, oh, he's drinking the good stuff. Okay, so he's not this guy over there just grabbing the, you know, the, the one dollar mug of beer and sucking it down, even though it tastes disgusting. You know, now you've got somebody who's drinking something a lot more culture. Uh, like what, you know, and it's the same thing like when I did, uh, I'm trying to think what the guy's name is. And again, again, this is why I have a wiki. Because uh, some of these characters out, you know, will really stick in my mind, some of them won't, which is the same thing with me and people. You know, you could tell me your name and I'll forget it two seconds after you say it. Do something memorable and I won't forget your name. It's just weird how my brain works. That's that's part of why I have you know have wiki and before that I had no, you know books full of notes and names and stuff like that and then text files and other stuff like that. But uh Yeah, okay, Craven Lucius. I was kinda close on the name, but I had to actually look it up in the wiki. Craven Lucius was the chief petty officer and bosun's mate of uh the Flying Coachman, uh, which was uh, Ramiro's ship. Uh, Craven, one of the things I do with him uh, is he's sitting in this bar, and I mentioned the fact that he's essentially a teetotaler, which means he's not over there sl slugging down a big, you know, big mug of ale, cheap or expensive or otherwise. You know, he's over there with T, Earl Grey Black, you know. <clears throat> and he's, you know, he's this older man. He's very refined and elegant, nicely dressed, kind of looks almost uh, colonial, U.S. colonial, uh, seventeen, mid 1700s, something like that. You know, and it those little details help build the larger character, which goes back to this farm. Uh, knowing the agriculture, knowing the, the farming culture, knowing the country culture, knowing the city culture, knowing those details 
helps with the story because it helps solidify your vision of the story. Uh, it gives depth to the characters. It gives uh, depth to the world, and that depth is what you build off of. And it, if and the more you have of the more depth you have, the easier it actually is to write. Um, because the idea behind all of that depth is you have more to work with. Even if it doesn't make it in the story, it's a foundation that helps drive things forward. It gives meaning and reason for why a character is the way they are. Or, you know, or a culture, or a society, or different things like that. Uh, let's see here, what's the next one? Oh, yeah, here's another one. Probably looking at this going, okay, so some old dude on a coal burner, uh, on cast iron skillet or whatever it is, cooking breakfast. Okay. Uh, but the question is, who is he? Why is he cooking on this? Where is he living? Obviously, his technological level is very low because he's got oil lamps. It's not super low because this is a manufactured stove. And those are manufactured lamps that are probably kerosene. So then that, you know, given the type of material, it's uh, probably late 1800s, early 1900s, probably more like early 1900s, especially since it's a photo. Uh, early 1900s, you know, like I say, late 1800s, cause they had cameras in the mid-1800s, but this wouldn't have been a common thing until like the early 1900s. Uh, is he a coal miner? Um, is he a farmer? Why is he, you know, why is his clothing ragged? Is it just because he's old and poor? Uh, you know, this, this is another thing. It's small items, but it's important items. It's items that drive the story. Uh, he's got an old-fashioned, not a cuckoo clock, but a pendulum clock up here. So, again, probably early 1900s. Um, Here's another one. This is a kind of an old-fashioned log cabin style dining room. Uh, you know, is this is this kind of the the era? Is this you know is this the era that the, that he's living in? Is he uh, you know is he living in something rustic like this, or is he just out camping? Because I mean, you got something. It's it's a rugged cabin cabin or cabin cabin, but you've got electric lights. You've got this fancy chandelier here, but then you've got a lot of uh, rustic, simple furniture. Uh, you've got fur. Uh, you got fur padding on these things. You've got the lace uh, window curtains. So could be early 1900s. That might be something where he's living in an area that has electricity, but also does not have a lot of really advanced technology, uh, or they live very simply. Uh, they, this looks like this is something from the local market. So they probably don't have grocery stores, they have local markets. And now that's little things, like I say, that you got to think about. Uh, this right here, again, another simple scene. But, you know, this one, you've got goats up here. It's kind of like the, okay, this one could go back to like the book Heidi, uh, if you've ever read that one. You know, okay, these guys are up in the mountains. What are these sheep? Who do they belong to? What are these mountains? How high up are they? Uh, what is the significance of them? Is the main character a goat farmer? Is he a sheep farmer? Is he a herdsman? Uh, you know, what are the dangers of the sheep being up here? Like, I'm pretty sure these guys over here, if somebody gets gets a fly up their butt, you know, some somebody's go or somebody's not going to have a good day because they're going to be ah splat. Whoop. I guess we're not having that lamb for dinner, you know. So that's something else, like I say, to think about. And uh, some of these I'm not going to like go into the full list of questions. I'm going to leave these to you to come up with because that's part of learning how to do this. I give you the impetus, I give you the start, and then it's up to you to go through these and practice them. If you want to write them into short stories, write them into short stories. If you want to use them as ideas on longer story, go ahead and write them into the longer stories. Uh, now this is another fun one. Uh, this one it would be a wor another world element. You've got a an owl that's wearing basic armor. Uh, you've got like a helmet, and this essentially is a harness. This isn't like armor or anything. Uh, it's the only, I, I would say if you've ever watched the uh, 
I'm probably butchering this. I think it's the Owls of Gahul or something like that. Or Guardians of Gahul, that's what it is. Um, where the heroes and the main characters were owls. Various types of owls, you know, like uh, Barn Owl, Digger Owl, stuff like that. In this one, it seems like you've either got very small people, fairies, uh, people who are uh, tiny people, and this is either a normal or a large-sized owl, or this could be a normal-sized human who's part of an air corps, and this thing is this thing is bloody huge, like a little 727 or something like that. Well, probably not as big as a 727. That's a big aircraft, but you know, let's just say like it's a a uh, a Cessna or a uh, I'm trying to think what some of those other private planes are. Uh, like, well, okay, maybe he's like uh, a little smaller than a than a DC three or something like that. You know, some basically some guy, some dude that when he has when he goes and has dinner, you know, dogs and ca uh, dogs and cats and goats and other small animals start disappearing. <laughs> maybe not horses. He's probably not big enough to eat a horse, but then again, he might be able to. Um, you could look at this and go, what is this? helmet. I would say like if you go back to the Guardians of Gahul, uh, that's because, you know, these guys are kind of the fighter jets of this world. They're the air transport, they're the dragons, but they're also the, uh, you know, the air combat wing of the of the area, and this guy is the pilot slash commander of this owl, and the owl's sentient, and he can talk. He might not be sentient, he may, might be like, you know, very intelligent horse in a sense. Uh, things like that and you know you can build a whole world behind this because you look like back here the guy the guy up here's got a, uh, got a sword up here probably because he can't wear one when he's sitting in the saddle uh, the saddle looks like it's harnessed in so that if they do a barrel roll he doesn't go <whistles> splat <laughs> and fall off of his mount uh, so you know and it's you, you have to ask yourself a lot of questions. Is this a commoner? Is this somebody with the king's army? Uh, things like that. So, let's go back here again. Ugh, not that. Get over here. Okay, I crashed it. Um, anywho, <laughs> I went and I crashed it. Uh-oh. That's not good. Um, let me see if I can bring that back up. Okay, I can't bring that back up, so I guess I'm going to have to restart, and we'll go into the next video with this one, and we'll finish up the rest of what we were doing. <laughs> Yay for technology! <laughs> so, anyhow, I guess I'll catch you on the next video.